Hello everyone, I'm Greg Tuhill. I'm a member of the ISACA Board of Directors and a member of ISACA maintaining my CISM uh, certification. And today I'm coming to you as a member of the Board of Directors to introduce our new chair of the Board of Directors, Pam Nigro. And Pam, I think our members would like to get to know you better as their chair. And today I really appreciate you sitting down with me uh, to talk through a few things so that everybody gets to know you a little bit better. So welcome. Thank you, Greg. I'm happy to be here. Well, thank you for uh, joining us. So let's start uh, for our audience, uh, our fellow ISACA members. Please tell us a little bit about yourself and your experience as an ISACA member. I've been with ISACA since about uh, 2007. And as a member, I was engaged in through the Chicago chapter. And from the Chicago chapter, I started getting involved in a lot of global activities. And from there, it led to the board of directors. And then from board of directors, I was elected chair this year. So very happy to be part of the organization for so long. And we're really glad as uh, members of the board to have somebody with your diverse experience uh, from a member uh, standpoint, uh, working in the chapters, regional work, uh, uh, you really encompass all that ISACA has to offer uh, for our members. I was just wondering, uh, prior to becoming chair, is there one particular ISACA experience that really stands out as one of those things that helped define you in your career? As an ISACA member, I think one of the things that really helped me as a defining moment on how I wanted to commit to ISACA was really when I was on the uh, chapter leaders council and working across globally um, with many different chapter leaders to really have an impact on how the chapters came together. So setting up things like Zoom, setting up things like you know, um, having an impact on emails and web pages and all sorts of things that help a chapter work on a regular basis. And, and it was exciting to see that many folks were struggling with some of the same things we were struggling here with at the Chicago chapter, and then be having the opportunity to really impact and make a change. Well, and, and you've made a profound impact, uh, you know, with a lot of folks, not only at the chapter level, but now uh, across the organization. Um, so, you know, as you've taken a look at your career, which has been successful uh, and leading up to not only the position of chair, but success in, uh, in business as well. I was wondering if you may be able to uh, briefly tell us, you know, what have you done during your career and how has ISACA helped you uh, through your successful career? So that's an interesting question because I never thought that this was going to be my career or my profession. And it wasn't a place that I started, but it is a place that I'm at and I couldn't love it anymore. It's just fantastic. I actually started in, in a different track and just realized that wasn't the path for me and started moving now into technology. And as I moved more and more into technology, I had an opportunity right when Sarbanes-Oxley came on board to kind of switch into the audit world. And the reason I did that, my original plan was that I was going to be a data center lead. So wouldn't it be best to know what the auditors want from the inside? And this way I could be the best data center lead that I could be. But when I got into auditing and I got into all the things that we were doing, managing risk and helping organizations really um, move forward with their technology struggles in the sense of, you know, how do you secure things? How do you make things private? All of that, I fell in love with it. I thought it was the best thing in the world. I, I loved every minute of what I was doing and um, was working on an engagement at a company that I was there for about 14 years and um, wound up staying and building out a practice at um, HCSC and helping to set up a lot of their GRC functions, pr primarily looking from a controls perspective. And then from there, launching into, you know, cybersecurity and working in the, in the security practice and really um, kind of bringing that full circle. This is all the things you learned about technology and the challenges that folks were having 
as a data center like individual or as an infrastructure individual or sysops person, which is the path I was originally on, I understand that. So I can bring that to the table when I work with people to try to help manage the risks and the cybersecurity challenges they have. Uh, you know, and um, you, you've been uh, hitting extremely well on all cylinders uh, throughout your professional career, and, and we're mighty proud of you. And one of the reasons why we elected you as our chair is because of that diversity of experience that, that you bring uh, to the boardroom, but also to our members. So thank you for that. Um, thank you. Speaking, of, speaking of diversity, you know, one of the things that uh, we're proud of in ISACA is, is that we're a global community with a very diverse membership, um, diverse cultures, diverse ages and experiences. Just, you know, uh, we find that that global community and that diversity brings us great strength. But, you know, one of the things that uh, uh, we've talked about in the boardroom, as well as in, in the lunchroom, the dining room, you know, all the different rooms out there is, the fact that when it comes to leadership, uh, we're still a, a heavily male-dominated uh, leadership uh, community of interest uh, across our various um, professional groups. Uh, as a female, um, you, you've been very successful, and now here you are as the chair of ISACA. What do you think the main challenges are that you've had to face and overcome during your career and how can you, um, as the board chair, help inspire others to uh, address some of them so that uh, we can, in fact, take advantage of all the diversity uh, that ISACA has to offer? That's a, a, an interesting and challenging question in many ways because culture does have a lot to do with it. And even in the information technology space, the cybersecurity space, we're still very focused in a, in a male-dominated organization. But I think at the same time, that's not something that should really stop us. That's not something that I think to focus on. The focus should be on being the best you can be, to being at the top of your game, and to always make sure that you are doing everything you can to promote yourself, to make sure that you're putting yourself out there. I think the biggest challenge is what I see is that there's uh, some women who um, may be a little bit reserved when it comes to participation and, and really kind of putting themselves out there. I think it's time to be bold. I think it's time to, to, to kind of like stand up and be counted because there's a lot of things that women bring to the table. And especially even in my own organization, right now in terms of how to bring a balanced look to things. And one of the things from my perspective in particular was around the business, right? And having the business be part of the conversation. And one of the things women are, are you know, um, good at sometimes is bringing people together and bringing people together uh, who have diverse thoughts and getting consensus and building a community that would actually then you know, help your organization continue to move forward. And that's always been part of what I've done and part of what I believe that um, is a skill that we can all learn and bring to the table. And that's one of the things that I hope as a board member and certainly as a chair that I bring to help us as a board come together and collaborate and come out with the best solution or the best strategy possible to continue moving forward. You know, Pam, having served as the chair of ISACA's board, as well as on other boards, I've learned uh, that the chair sets the agenda. Uh, so as you assume the role of chair of ISACA's board of directors, what's on the top of the agenda for you? One of the things for me, Greg, I think that's most important is to double down on this bold vision that we have put together around digital trust. I believe ISACA has a tremendous opportunity. I believe there's a lot that we can do to start to converge in many different areas and opportunities within digital trust. I believe we can start to help individuals see the potential, the positive potential of technology and really bringing that together 
And so for me, as a chair of ISACA, it's really to enable that strategy and enable that vision that we have put forward as the board of ISACA. Thank you for that. You know, we're going to be facing some challenges together in a challenging world. You know, right now, um, uh, many parts of the world uh, are starting to enjoy emerging from uh, the, the pandemic, but we still have uh, uncertainty around the world uh, with the, uh, the tensions in Europe uh, between Russia uh, and their invasion of Ukraine. We have across the globe uh, economic concerns over inflation and uncertainty in the world uh, is a fact of life for our members, regardless of where they are in the world. How do you think uh, ISACA can rise to meet the challenges and help our members uh, best deal with the uncertainties of the world? There are many opportunities that uh, present to us from a uh, perspective of ISACA. ISACA has the um, opportunity to bring forward new training, new learning, new chance to continue to grow and to be diverse in these different technologies. We're seeing, you know, part of the pandemic, everybody just took whatever was on-prem and put it into the cloud. And, you know, that's not really a, a cloud-centered uh, organization. There now has to be that transformation. And so helping organizations manage that risk and looking at that risk profile and whether that's a cyber risk or an IT risk, or even some cases a financial risk. Those are all things that we can help organizations do. And as ISACA, we can enable our members to really be you know, at the table to help organizations succeed in those spaces. Thank you for that, Pam. You know, and one of the things that prior to the pandemic that uh, we as board of directors, uh, uh, as well as the chair and uh, the CEO got to do uh, to help us better serve the members was get out and visit different chapters and regional events and things of that nature. Um, what, do you think that that's something that uh, we're gonna be able to uh, resume as we uh, move into your tenure as the chair? Well, I believe so. And I'm looking forward to it actually. And I believe we will be having our board meeting as part of the um, European uh, CACS conference in Rome. And so we're trying to be on the ground with different members and meet different members. The other good thing is that we have a whole global strategy and initiative. And Chris DiCermatis was really um, on the forefront of that. And I got an opportunity to participate with him. So I got to be with a lot of the different leaders all throughout the different regions. And it was really exciting to reconnect with people again. Some of the folks I knew from other conferences or other uh, interactions that I had, and some of the folks I was meeting for the first time. And it was really great to hear the concerns for each of the different regions, the concerns for the different um, cultures and, and the different companies within those cultures, and then to be able to come up with a strategy or come up with an approach that's going to meet the needs of such a diverse population. So I think we have an opportunity through that process. We have an opportunity when we have board meetings to make sure that we're meeting in the communities where people are at, it's either from conferences or chapters at, and connecting with folks through those events. Well, thanks. You know, as, uh, as I've talked with folks from uh, around the world of ISACA, I, I think there's a, a hunger uh, for a lot of our members to get back together physically where they can, but also still maintain the digital presence uh, where it makes sense. And uh, I, I'm, I'm glad to hear that getting out and uh, being physically present uh, where it makes sense and where it's safe is part of your game plan. Uh, for the board and how we serve our members better. You know, let, let me switch gears for a second, talk about uh, another leadership issue. Uh, it's been said that leaders are not born that way, they're made, and they're made through a combination of experiences and, and, and mentorship. And mentorship is a huge part of growing into being a, an effective leader. 
Are there any mentors that stand out during your experience that helped you be as successful as you are? There are many. I wish I could name one. And and there were so many people along the journey who have helped me along the way. There was one mentor in particular that, that comes to mind. And really what it was about was understanding the landscape. So he had a, he was very attuned to the different nuances of the culture of the organization and where things were were moving and who was the person that was going to you know get the projects or that different kinds of things and help me see what was happening or navigate that landscape understand what was going on and and really um be able to work through those processes right and be able to work within that organization rather than always sometimes being like a, a force against it. And, and so that was one that was very strong. I would like to say also, and you've heard me say this many times, I believe, and I don't want to sell another organization, but I'm going to say it, Toastmasters is probably one of the greatest organizations for communication and leadership skills. And that's the secret that Toastmasters doesn't let out. They also have leadership skills. Also, I think we're we're changing our organization too, and some of the things that we are preparing for the chapters in terms of what does it mean to be a vice president, what does it mean to be a secretary, what does it mean to be a treasurer of an organization. We really started to bring those um, guidebooks to to the to the different members of our organization, so that we in the chapter can start creating leaders. It is important that you engage in those types of situations, whether it's in your local chapter, whether it's in a Toastmasters learning how to have conversations and do presentations, or whether it's with an individual who helps you understand the landscape of your organization. It is important to engage in those because we need the next generation of leaders in ISACA. You know, I don't want to be the, the chair of the board forever, nor do I want to serve on the board forever. And it's really important that we continue to develop and engage our community so that we can continue to develop and grow the leaders from within. So Pam, I think in this last question, you answered portions of what I'm going to ask you now. Uh, so I'll compliment you on your Jedi skills of reading my mind with this particular question. And the question is, for those members that are watching this podcast and are thinking, hey, I want to serve on the ISACA Board of Directors, what do I need to be doing now to prepare myself to compete to be a member of the Board of Directors? Greg, that's a great question. And I would encourage people to serve on your local chapters to develop the leadership skills. It is not about being a cybersecurity expert, an IT audit expert, a risk expert when you become a member of the board. It is really about understanding the business, understanding the landscape, being able to have a greater vision about what needs to be done in the future and how we need to move forward as an organization. And even in my own personal career, all the technical skills that I learned as I was coming up through, you know, my time and in, 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 a, in throughout my career journey, those aren't the skills that are serving me now as a, as a VP of an organization. Those aren't necessarily the skills that are serving me now as the chair of the board of directors. It's really about communication skills. It's really about taking those technology skills that you know you understand breaking them down in a way that's consumable, not only for your audience, but placing a business perspective around them, understanding that cybersecurity has a business component to it as well. Risk has a business component. All of these have business components that really need to be understood. So part of what I did on my career journey was to go back to school and get my MBA so that I can, again, move into the business and understand the conversations that were happening and the concerns that were happening and become more versatile in, in what it is I needed to do. Understanding how to read financial statements, understanding how to talk to the CFO, the COO, 
What were their concerns and how could I show that what we were doing in cybersecurity or what we were doing in IT audit, not only aligned to what they were doing, but actually supported them. And in order, then I would ask, you know, for support from them as well. So those are the kinds of things that I think will help propel your career forward and give you the skills needed to serve at your local chapters and maybe at regional uh, events and regional meetings, and then ultimately on to the board of directors. That's awesome. Now, I do have a few uh, uh, questions left in the amount of time we have. So the first one is, what about ISACA's mission excites you the most? Well, that's a little bit uh, broader than, than just a, a simple answer. So I'm going to kind of take you a little bit on a journey with me and, and share a little story around this. One of the things that ISACA talks about is having the positive potential of technology and really the focus on positive, right? We're here to you know, have that experience with technology that uplifts and doesn't oppress an individual. And many individuals look to a dystopian future of 1984. So if they think about how the world is going to you know, go into a negative place, the world that they think about is 1984. I would like to challenge that thinking a little bit and really say that maybe the dystopian future we should look at is Huxley's A Brave New World. Because in his Brave New World, he starts to talk about how individuals willingly surrender their privacies, their freedoms for conveniences. And I see that happening in our society today. I look at things like TikTok and people who are willingly surrendering their privacy, their individualism to create a, a three minute or one minute TikTok video. And then what happens with that information? What do they do with that? And so I believe ISACA has a real role to play and that positive potential, helping organizations use the information appropriately, using it in a way that will continue to support the individual and not use it against the individual. So that is really, I think, a role that ISACA can really play in and really start to build out to where we talk about positive potential. We're here to help organizations navigate that gray so that they don't overuse information for a negative purpose, but only use it for its appropriate purpose. Thank you, and that force of good is something that I think is shared across our community, uh, regardless of what country you're in, what career field you're in, what company you work for, we all wanna do the right thing the right way. So, you know, from a value proposition standpoint, how would you articulate you know, why ISACA to somebody who's never heard of us before? I think ISACA has several items going for it. And I think the main one really is ISACA's community. It's the community of professionals that get together, share knowledge, exchange information, exchange ideas, and really then help put forth the structure to help organizations realize that positive potential. So if you think about how COVID was built and, and how COVID has evolved over the years, it has been through the people with boots on the ground who's had the experiences that wanna share that knowledge, that wanna get out and guide other organizations to maybe building out the right framework, to maybe helping them measure uh, their, their uh, risk appropriately. So I think that's really the value proposition of ISACA. I think that is really where we, we shine and where we're the strongest. I think our certifications are also very strong. The things that we look for, the years of experience that we want, the other things to um, round out an individual so that you, you uh, can feel confident if somebody has an ISACA certification that this person has the fundamental knowledge and, and skills that you need 
as, as a hiring manager or someone, you know, an HR person in an organization. Those are the value propositions of ISACA. And those are the things that I believe will keep us strong in the future. Okay, Pam. So you just told us a little bit about some of those superpowers that ISACA has and brings to our community. What are some of the superpowers that you have that can help our community? I actually think the one superpower I have, which is really, really actually still comes strong and still comes through even today, is that I'm able to take concepts, very complex concepts, very difficult concepts, and break them down and deliver them in a way that is consumable and understandable, even by non-technologists, by non-ISACA people. I'll give you an example. In about 2018, 2019, I did um, cybersecurity in Game of Thrones. Right, so really started to show how the two lent itself to one another, really started to show how if you're watching Game of Thrones, you're really seeing cybersecurity in action um, and some of these other kinds of things. And one quick example is if you look at the Assassin Guild, right, and how they try to infiltrate each other's um, areas to uh, get information, and, you know, again, very much the threats that you have in the cyber world try to infiltrate your organization to get information. So being able to address that in a way that people get it and people can start to then take actions is one of the things that I think I bring to the table and make, you know, kind of my superpower. I think from ISACA perspective, it's taking individuals like me and other individuals and allowing us to present at conferences and allowing us to get these ideas out there and raising up everyone else in our community so that we can continue to have these conversations and we can give the skill sets to different people um, to have to take back to their perspective areas and have these conversations. I actually just Tuesday and, I, and I, I was reached out by an individual and wants to know if he could leverage my Game of Thrones. A presentation and absolutely i'm i'm 100 willing to share so it was it was you know great to see that some of those things are still very relevant oh that's great to hear well pam you you've told us a whole lot about you and i've been kind of like the uh, the grand inquisitor here um <laughs> any questions for me since uh, you know you're the new chair and I, i'm a former chair what can I do to answer any questions that you may have? So, Greg, I would ask you, what advice would you give to me as the new chair coming in and what what things you think I should prepare for? Um, thank you for asking that. I think it's important that we as chairs um, keep the focus on the members. Uh, we are a member organization. We're volunteers. We're not paid to serve on the board of directors, we invest our time, um, and our energy and uh, our, our imagination and experience on behalf of our members. So keeping the board focused on how is this serving the member the best, um, I think is critically important. And as you are putting the agenda together, as you are helping us set the priorities, I think it's important for all of us to be focused on our fellow members. That's great. And, and I couldn't agree more. I think you're right. As a member organization, we must do everything we can to keep the member in mind. But now that you've had a little bit of time kind of away from being the board chair, what were some of the things that you would say were your best experiences and maybe the favorite things that you got to do as chair? Well, there's so many highlights that I could share, not only from my time as the uh, board chair, but ha having served on the board for uh, the last couple of years. Uh, ultimately, um, the, the, the highlight has been the engagement with our fellow members. And during my tenure, we had the, the COVID-19 pandemic was well underway. Uh, and I'm going to take off my glasses so I don't get the glare from uh, the lights because uh, I I don't need to read uh, any scripting here. Uh, but I think getting um, the ability of technology saving the day during the pandemic and during my board tenure, being able to engage with our fellow members uh, in, in their time zones was just phenomenal. 
And uh, David Samuelson and I, we initiated, um, at my request, uh, a series of engagements where we would ha have an Ask Me Anything session for folks in regions around the world. I remember having conversations with folks in Oceania and the Asia Pacific region, um, talking with folks uh, down in South America, folks with, uh, within uh, Africa, and getting their perspectives and hearing their stories um, and, and learning from them, not only about how they and their chapters are doing things to better serve the membership and uh, share across our broader global community. That was inspiring and something I really greatly treasure. And um, that helps inform my contributions to the board as I resume duties as a, uh, a director uh, without the chair title and responsibilities. But th those engagements uh, as chair uh, were really meaningful and still excite me and inspire me to this day. Well, that's awesome, Greg. And I would just say now, um, you know, there's going to be an opportunity for me to do an Ask Me Anything. So I would take a look at that um, on our Engage platform. So I won't get up and, and, and do it in the middle of the night like you, Greg, but I will still be able to engage with the global community. So that's fantastic. And I'm glad that was so uh, meaningful for you as, as a chair. The thing about it was, is I wanted to make sure that I wasn't making the members get up in the middle of their nights to talk to me during my day. Uh, because the service is part of my ethos. I think it's part of our ethos as a, uh, as a community in ISACA. Uh, so I wanted to make sure I got up at a time and got in front of them at a time that was convenient for them and not for me. Uh, because I volunteered to be here. And boy, I'll tell you what, the reception I got from South America, Africa, Oceania, Asia Pacific, I mean, it was just tremendous. I learned so much from our members. And I'm sure that you're gonna, you're gonna do the same. And uh, with the pandemic, uh, it seems to be under control or uh, ebbing, you know, we'll, we'll be able to resume getting out in person for regional and chapter events. I'm looking forward to that, and I hope you are too. Oh, I most certainly am, Greg, thank you. And now, just as a last closing thought, what's next? You, you've, you're the, you've been the chair of the ISACA Board of Directors, and for many, that is like the achievement. So what's next for you? Well, you know, if a uh, Board of Director Chair of ISACA is the pinnacle of ISACA membership. Um, you know, as I take a look at my professional community um, and as a cybersecurity professional, I've been blessed to have just a, a wonderful career. You know, I, uh, I retired from uh, the military as a general officer. I was appointed by the president of the United States as uh, the United States government's first uh, federal chief information security officer. And now I've got kind of like that dream job in cybersecurity of running uh, the CERT here at Carnegie Mellon University Software Engineering Institute. So um, one of the things I'm doing on a professional basis in my day job is, is I'm helping the CERT pivot from a more reactive cyber incident response posture to a more proactive uh, cybersecurity engineering and resilience team. And uh, we've launched a new strategy within CERT uh, that's based on four uh, primary goals, uh, advance cyber by design, enhance cyber resilience, help move the market, and fourth, shape the future. So time and energy right now is engaged uh, with my team here at the CERT to execute that strategy and execute it well. And uh, the payoff is a much more secure cyber ecosystem that'll better protect everybody, not only here in the United States, but around the world. And uh, that's what's, uh, what's next for me. Uh, but I'm gonna continue to serve on the board of directors at ISACA until my term limit uh, comes up uh, in two years. And I'm looking forward to continuing to serve not only the global cyber ecosystem, our global community uh, as the leader of the CERT, but also to serve uh, 
as a member of uh, ISACA's board of directors. Well, Greg, your participation and your insights will be most welcome and will really, I think, help us prepare and propel the, our digital trust initiatives forward. And I certainly would welcome your advice and your guidance as the chair for ISACA. Thank you so much, Pam. And uh, thank you so much for uh, uh, this conversation today. And I hope that our fellow members uh, got a lot out of this podcast. And I look forward to uh, spending more time with you at our next meeting and getting back into the European theater with some of our members out there. Uh, but uh, I, I look forward to uh, serving our members and us together, uh, getting out and spending time with our fellow members so that we can serve them better. Greg, thank you for, for the opportunity today. I really appreciate being able to share my story and really appreciate the opportunity to, to explore ISACA's message and strategy a little bit deeper. So thank you so much. Thank you, folks. Thank you, Pam. And uh, I hope you'll join ISACA for the next ISACA podcast.